All right, people, in an effort to move this thing across the United States, not just center on the big cities uh, on the East Coast, let's talk about the San Francisco, San Jose mobs, who were big. They were substantial in their day. The mob, uh, Francisco Lanza, organized the first mafia family in San Francisco, but it was at the end of a civil war that started out there in 1928 between Lanza and the city's crime boss, a guy named Jerry Ferry, F-E-R-I. Uh, Ferry had been murdered by his business partner, Alfredo Scarci. Uh, both of those guys, Scarcio, Scariso, I'm sorry, and Ferry had been members of the Chicago mob. Although I checked newspapers.com, couldn't find any mention of them. But transferring into the San Francisco mob, which was an upstart, was not uncommon. Uh, the Genovese family had a guy out there. So did the um, Gambino families. But those two were those two people I'm mentioning. Uh, were probably sent out by the families in New York to keep an eye on their interest out there. But there were other guys out there, aside from Chicago, New Orleans sent people, Tampa, Cleveland had guys out there, or had been with those mobs and then transferred out there with, I guess they thought, might be more opportunity. As for Ferry, he was a known member of organized crime. Uh, among his bad deeds, he had kidnapped and then murdered a speakeasy owner named, listen to this, Gigi Babyface Beguini in 1927. I love that name. Apparently, Ferry and Scariso had fallen into an argument in Ferry's apartment at 490 Lumber Street. Uh, they were both in love with this actress named Elaine Worth. Uh, she, Worth, lived with Ferry. Uh, there was an argument. Scariso left the apartment. He came back with a gun and uh, killed Ferry, uh, who was in his boxer shorts at the time, in his bathroom. He shot him 12 times. Wow. According to Worth, she and Ferry had planned to marry that week. Anyway, after Ferry's killed, Scaricio goes into hiding. And Worth eventually takes up with this uh, married gangster named, uh, he was a rapist as well, Frank Grupico. Uh, Grupico's brother Mike was an old-fashioned blackhander, uh, an extortionist, in other words. He had been gunned down in San Francisco, as a lot of those blackhanders were in 1924. Franco Pico was locked up in 1931 by the Secret Service on uh, counterfeiting charges. Anyway, a warrant was put out for Scaricio the same day as the killing, but on December 19, 1928, near Sacramento, uh, he gets killed by two hoods, uh, Frank Boca and Mario Filipino, uh, and they murdered his associate, Vito Peligi. I'm killing these names. From what the investigators could gather, the men were run off the road and riddled with bullets by four gunmen, we know the names of two of them, who stood a few feet away from the car. Uh, a photo of Elaine Worth was found in Scaricio's pocket. Isn't that charming? Some five days later, on December 22, Filippi was killed by persons unknown, Filippi being one of the gunners. A year later, in July of 1929, Boca, another one of the shooters, uh, was killed. He was shot and stabbed by persons unknown, for reasons unknown. He was left on the corner of Noriega and 29th Avenue in San Francisco. Uh, there's a possibility he was killed either by one of his many lovers, um, all of whom were married, or by one of the husbands. Uh, I think that's interesting. When they note that in a newspaper article, it's interesting. In October 1930, Gennaro Braccolo, the self-proclaimed Al Capone of the West. Can you imagine having that kind of a stupid ego? Um, he also liked to be referred to as Gennaro the Magnificent. Oh, my God. Uh, was also murdered by Ralph Esposito, one of his blackmail victims. Uh, Esposito told the court, Bracolo bled me. He bled me as he has many others. I knew him intimately before we came to this country 10 years ago. He killed a man over there in Italy. Over the years, he took more than 1500 from me. I was afraid for my life. 1500 is a lot of money at that time. I was afraid for my life. Power in San Francisco and the mafia or organization probably fell to this guy named Luigi Malvisi until he was murdered on the streets in May of 1932. 32. The killer leaps from the running board of Malvisi's car uh, onto the running board, I'm sorry, of Malvisi's car while he's driving in the middle of the day and shoots him through the head. Police rounded up 11 suspects, but it was never solved, of course. Uh, although the killer was probably Frank Lanza. Lanza had been a pimp, a bootlegger, big-time drug dealer, loan shark, uh, just an all-around bad guy. 
So Lanza took control of San Francisco's organized crime, running it from the Fisherman's Wharf. Uh, it's interesting. He probably owned the wharf with Giuseppe Alito. Lanza died of natural causes at 54. Alito's grandson, I think, became mayor of the city. They're a prominent family out there. Lanza died of natural causes at age 54 uh, in 1937. And a hood named Anthony Lima took over and he built the rackets uh, that Lanza had started focusing on labor unions. In a town full of interesting characters, uh, Lima was really interesting. He was from uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. He had been inducted into the Pittsburgh mob in 1927. A lot of guys from Pittsburgh would eventually transfer out to San Jose, San Francisco. It was almost an extension. Because Pittsburgh was smaller, limited in the rackets, and there was a lot of guys who wanted to be in the rackets, they got him in there, inducted him, and then expanded themselves out to the West Coast. So he's inducted in 1927, immediately gets himself uh, indicted for murder. He was acquitted, of course, of course. After the trial, he moves to San Francisco and he starts rackets out there, extortion, fraud. But with those profits, he opened a huge car dealership uh, and also an olive oil importing dealership and a cheese company. Uh, it was a big market, a large Italian population in, in that area. And it was a big market for this. And he became rich from that. Although he was married to his cousin, Nancy Lima, Lima's uncle and cousin also relocated later to California and be became affiliated with the San Francisco family. He had three children, but he kept two girlfriends. Uh, and he gave them, bought them both houses on Carl Street at opposite ends of the street. You got to love these guys. So anyway, the near con, uh, constant influx of mafias from Pittsburgh and other parts of Pennsylvania wasn't lost on the San Francisco police who formed a no-holes-barred gangster squad in 1931. It was one of the first Western states to do so. And then when that squad got word of a new hood had arrived in town, they'd swoop down, work them over, lock them up on a vagrantry charge, and then toss them on the first train out of town. Tell them, don't come back. This time it was a beating. Next time you're just going to disappear. So up and aside from that, the, the San Francisco police were generally honest. Uh, there wasn't a huge graft culture in there, out there at the time. And they were tough and they had a rep reputation uh, that spread to hoods who were constantly on, thinking about moving out west. So they were something to consider. It was also around this time that Joe Pizzea, P-I-Z-Z-A, I'm not pronouncing these names right, uh, he's a former blackhander as well. I assume we all know what a blackhander was. They were independent operators who uh, were scumbag. They worked within their Italian community and would shake down honest store owners or anyone, really. There were instances in New York where they shook down priests, for God's sakes, for a cut of the take uh, on Sunday. And um, anyway, he got out of that and he joins the mafia in Pennsylvania. And he eventually becomes the underboss of the San Francisco crime family. Pizia was brash. He was arrested in Berkeley, California in 1931 for possession of liquor, a truck full. He got caught, caught canvassing Berkeley's business district displaying samples of 30 gallons of liquor from his car, this guy. Uh, he had originally opposed the leadership of Lanza. And they, they, did, they never got along. The two of them never got along. Uh, according to... Uh, Lima Piazza w was later murdered for attempting to extort uh, the father of a future San Francisco mayor, Joe Alito, uh, who operated a fish company on the wharf. Uh, I couldn't locate the, uh, the murder uh, in the papers. I'm sure it happened. But there uh, was also a Joe Piazza who was with the San Jose family. He was a soldier and a bookmaker. Two are often confused. Uh, who fronted as a real estate salesman. That Piazza had been part of the Bay Area San Francisco burglar ring called the Sam Bailey Gang, infamous in its day. Piazza, um, along with a guy named Emmanuel Figlia, was allegedly involved in 1976 gangland slaying of Boston hitman Joe Barbosa in San Francisco. Uh, it was Piazza who got the van used in the murder by a patriarchal crime family soldier named Joe Russo. Uh, in 1977, Piazza, who had international mafia connections, he's arrested for being involved with the gangland execution of Peter Cattelia in San Jose, California. In 1977, Cattelia Jr. tried to get a job with Marino's Cheese Company, uh, California Cheese, 
big place, which controlled 85% of the cheese distribution in California. Imagine that. And 50% of the cheese manufacturing distribution west of the Mississippi. Gee, I wonder how they captured that market. So the company was started by uh, his father, Salvatore, who was, again, a member of the Pittsburgh family, and for decades uh, was used as an excuse to import members from the Sicilian Mafia into the U.S. as cheesemakers. I think there was something on The Sopranos about that, wasn't there? So Marino took over the wealthy San, Francisco, San Jose Rackets in 1978. He was extremely close uh, with San Francisco's Mayor Joelita, as well as the San Francisco crime boss Alonza and Los Angeles concierge, uh, consigliere and FBI informant Frank Ben Pinzirio, who they eventually murdered. When Marino refused to hire Catalina, we're back there now again, Catalina stupidly tried to extort 100000 from Marino. What is this guy thinking? So Marino ordered Catalina's father, Orlando, to kill his son in a trailer on a <laughs> on, on the cheese factory compound, but Orlando refused the order. So Marina kills them both. These people. Pete Catalina, the son, in, in the head, and the father, Orlando, uh, was shot as well. Uh, they stuffed, but he survived. So they stuffed them both in the trunk of a car, a Cadillac, and the idea is they'd abandon the car at the Oakland airport. But the driver got lost, and it's, nobody knows who he was. But he got lost, and the car, he just leaves the car there uh, on Harrison Street in San Francisco. Well, passive buyers hear Picatello, the father, screaming from inside the truck. Police come. On October 12, 1980, Marino, this is the guy who owned the cheese company, was convicted of secondary murder and attempted murder. That was overturned on appeals, remarkably, and he was released. He died of a congested heart failure, a diabetes thing, in 1983. Piazza, the guy who actually went forward with the killings, was convicted of false imprisonment. That's it, in, in this case. And he was sentenced to a measly 16 months in prison in 1980. He would die of stomach cancer uh, in February 2005. His brother, Pete, was also a driver for Angelo Marino. So the post-war boom, World War II, brought an enormous influx of guys uh, from all over the country into San Francisco, which was booming again. So one of them was this guy, Terrifio, uh, Giuseppe Terrifio. He was a member of the Sicilian Mafia. And he eventually somehow got into the Cleveland mob and arrived in California in 1947. His son, Steve, was a made man in the San Francisco family in the 1960s, and he ran a small gambling operation near Sacramento. Frank uh, Scaputa was also uh, found his way from Chicago to France, San Francisco and became a capo, a captain. His front companies included uh, Sunland Sales Company, an olive oil company, another olive oil company cor called Cornette. Otherwise, Caputa was an extortionist, and he shook down then what was illegal abortionist uh, in the San Francisco area. He was one of the suspects in 1947 murder of Chicago mobster Nick DeJohn. Uh, Dick John was a knockaround guy. He wasn't really in the mob in, in Chicago. He was just a, a freelancer, sort of. Uh, Scaputo and Anthony Lima, who was then the boss, were identified by eyewitnesses as either being near the car where Dijon would be found or in the car. Uh, anyway, Dijon was a Chicago, uh, obviously he's a drug peddler, really. He had connections all over the underworld and a lot of connections in Europe with the French where he got his dope. Uh, he had worked for the Capone organization during his prohibition. Uh, stayed on work for Frank Nitti for a little while, slipped into California around 1946. He was living in Santa Rosa under the name Nick Rossi. Eventually, he started narcotics racket in San Francisco with Lima and his under, Lima's underboss, Lima was the boss, and his underboss, uh, Mike Abati. They also shared an interest in Sunland Oil Company. On May 7th, 1947, Dijon had dinner with some guys at the legendary Poodle Dog Restaurant. And then they went across to La Casa's Corner and Tavern on Columbia Avenue, North Beach for drinks. It was he and four other men. They left there around one o'clock. Someone, a witness said that they mentioned they were all going to go play a card game. Two days later, May 9, Dijon has found trunk music. He's in the back of a car, trunk of a car on Laguna Street. So the body had been stripped of an expensive watch, a diamond ring, and around 1400 1500 in cash. Dijon was probably killed, the theory is, because he intended to make a move against Lima and grab power in San Francisco. 
But in 1957, the Rackets Committee linked him in an attempt to take over Texas labor rackets, which may have been a reason to kill him. There's a theory, a third theory, is that he had an associate in San Francisco, a nightclub owner named Jack Kent. Uh, Kent, they think, had paid to have Dijon murdered because Dijon stole money from Kent, a lot of money. The two had been in the business of converting an old French resort uh, into a casino in a high-priced brothel. Kent left the country right after the Dijon murder. Nothing ever came of that. There was only one witness, Anita Venza. Uh, she's a prosecutor's nightmare. She's an abortionist. She's got a long record. She over she testified she overheard Lima planning to kill Dijon, which is questionable, but because he wanted to muscle in on the black market cooking oil rackets. I don't know. But her story was just so full of holes that her testimony was discounted. She was later convicted of running an abortion mill in 1955. Lima and Abadi, his underboss, uh, were charged in the murder, <laughs> not convicted. And officially, the case remains uh, unsolved, of course. Leonard Calamia, another Chicago uh, narcotics dealer, was at the bar with Dijon on the night he disappeared. Camila was arrested for the murder, but he too was released. Uh, in 1967, Anthony Lima, who had been the boss, told the FBI that he played some role in the Dijon execution. I don't know why he said that, but he admitted it. And Nani, a Sicilian mafioso guy who came here uh, to San Francisco by, by way of Cleveland, was never questioned in the killing because he was deported back to Italy in the 1950s on a narcotics conviction. 1950s, narcotics was big and it was booming in the mob, but unfortunately for the mob in the 1950s, the Kefauver Committee was around. The McClellan Committee followed in the very late 1950s. So big legal battles going on. He had been president, uh, Nanny had been president at the Rio on Appalachia. Uh, in 1948, uh, a year after the Dijon's murder, Dijon's watch and ring turned up in a Brooklyn pawn shop. And Nanny turned out, Oh, had the, the so in 1952, kind of uh, Anthony Lima is uh, convicted of grand theft and conspiracy. He was the acting boss. He's sent to San Quentin for four years. He's released in 1959, but his power had waned and nobody was really into He was replaced by a soldier named Michael Abetti, who was his former business partner, as boss of the mob out there. Lima stayed on with the mob uh, as a soldier, mostly. So Abetti uh, came, like everyone else, from Pittsburgh, and he developed a rap sheet uh, for armed robbery, violation of interstate commerce, murder, kidnapping, and blah, blah, blah. What he was best known for was his deep, deep political connections, and he had a series of impressive legitimate business holdings. Uh, in 1957, Abate and his underboss, Jimmy Lanza, were picked up at the raid in Appalachian. Uh, the end came for Abate, it's Abate, uh, in 1961, when he was deported back to Italy in, uh, on July 8th, the age of 61. He died a year later. Jimmy the Hat Lanza, Frank Lanza's son, took over. He would run the San Francisco family from 1961 through 89. When, when it effectively came to an end, uh, Lanza died in 2006 at an age of 103. Wow, God bless him. Lanza unlike a lot of these other guys, was born wealthy because of his father. He was raised in the rich suburbs. He was a very cautious guy. He was wary of informants. And because of that, he told Pittsburgh, don't send anybody else out here. We're, we're all set. Thank you. We don't need anybody. You don't want anybody working there he hadn't known for decades. Um, Lenz also stopped making new members. So at the time, uh, he solidified ties with Joe Civellio of Dallas and Joe Cerrito of San Jose, the boss is down there. His longtime underboss, Bill Scorrentino, was the cousin of the underboss of the Los Angeles crime family, uh, Samuel Scorrentino. Lanza was well connected in Las Vegas by a guy named, a really interesting guy, William Bones Reamer, who's a Jewish associate with ties to the Genovese family, the Chicago families. He was, as I said, Reamer was an interesting guy. Uh, a casino owner named Warren Nelson, who worked for Rima, described that he was a 300-pound guy as, quote, the meanest, crudest man who ever lived. And his nickname, um, Bones, was a joke because uh, he fluctuated between uh, 300 and something pounds, almost 350 pounds. Um, he had a, I'm not going to pronounce it, indoctrine disorder, indoctrine disorder, disorder of the blood. 
1929, Reamer was hired to manage the, the infamous Lake Tahoe Cal Neva Lodge, which I heard was, they're trying to reopen, by the way. This is the one owned by, later on by Frank Sinatra, Joe Kennedy. It, it was one of Nevada's oldest casinos. It's right on the, the line, California, Nevada line. Uh, in 1930, Reamer made headlines when he tried unsuccessfully to collect $13,000, a lot of money in 1930. Uh, it was a blackjack debt uh, run by Clara Bow, the actress. She just stopped payment on three checks totaling the thirteen thousand. Uh, be just under two hundred thousand today, which means she'd racked up really bad credit with Cal Neva. Uh, they even gifted her stupidly with a bottle of whiskey when she'd arrived on the property and gave her the best room. Reamer told the debtor, "Look, it's a big lake. It ain't full yet. You know what I mean." You're going to pay this off, and I mean now. Uh, who knows if she actually did. When the Calneva owner went to prison in 1937 for mail fraud, Rima took over the club as owner. His wife divorced him following on the grounds of physical and, and uh, mental cruelty. Uh, she'd given Reamer around 220000 in today's to buy the Calneva Lodge and quoted him as telling her, I got so much publicity out of Clara Bow thing, the bump checks she give me, that now I know everyone and I'm hobnobbing with the elite. You're no help to me now, just a detriment. Wow, what a prick. In the divorce settlement, Reamer had to pay her around today's dollars, 270,000 in cash and 150 a month, around 2,700 today in alimony, wow. One of his first moves was to open a sideline business, laundering money through the casinos, which is something they'd done for decades and decades in Las Vegas for the racketeers and bank robbers. Among his customers was Alvin Carpus and Babyface Nelson, uh, who were paranoid over marked bills. In the 1940s, with permission from the San Francisco mob, Reamer extends his operations into Northern California, where he ran the 21 Club in El Cerrito. 21 Club is a favorite name for, was a favorite name for mob clubs, especially in Chicago. The Oak City Club, uh, the 1080 Edie, the Menlo Club in San Francisco, where he hired Jack Ruby and his sister Eva Ruby to work at the club as card dealers. So again, Ruby pops up with the mob. He also ran dozens of fronts across the city for his gambling operations. Uh, the saying was you couldn't get a, a cigar at Reamer's B&R smoke shop, uh, but you could always make a bet on the horses. In 1950, along with uh, St. Uh, Louis booking named Tommy Whalen and an actress, uh, Vic Raff, Vicky Raff, V-I-C-I, -I, isn't that cute? Uh, they were arrested at a huge brawl in the Encore Bar in West Hollywood one morning. A dozen cops had to come in. Reamer was charged for punching them both and public intoxication. It was a real stink. It made the papers for a while. A few years later, Reamer was subpoenaed to testify before the Senate Kefauver Commission, but he managed to hide out in Mexico until the hearings were over. Uh, according to him, though, he was in Arizona. And I'm saying that the way he said it, peasant hunting, pheasant hunting. Although Reamer was able to beat local gambling charges for decades, the IRS nabbed him, which is, you, you really can't be a wise guy with the federal government. At some point, they're, they're going to win. So they seized his assets. In 1952, they convicted him for, once they seized his assets, they were to see what he had, of evading around 128000 in taxes. That was then. Can you imagine what it is today? He won a new trial on appeal, but he was convicted again in 1956. They sent him to five years and a $20,000, $185,000 uh, fine. Uh, he served two and a half years. He was paroled in 1961. In 1959, the government sold uh, Reamer's assets, which came to today's dollars, just under a million dollars. Uh, and they kept it all for fines and back taxes. He ended up selling cars, used cars, at his brother's lot in Oakland, California. He died after undergoing... Uh, treatment for uh, an ailment uh, at age 65 in 1963. But while he was around, in he had 1968, you had to remember, it was, people didn't know as much about the mob then as we do now. Life magazine is a great magazine. It came to your house on Saturdays, mostly photographs. Uh, published a photo of James, Lan James Lanza and declared him to be the boss of the San Francisco mob. This was really big news in those days. Today, it wouldn't even get mentioned. 
The press knew that Lanza and San Francisco's Mayor Joe Alito were close, and they publicized it, and that brought in troubles. But it was the least of his problems. For reasons unknown, probably jealousy, former boss Anthony Lima, who's now just a knock-around guy, no longer boss, he begins to cooperate in or about 1965 until 1969. Lima tells federal agents that he was inducted into the Pittsburgh family in 1927. Pittsburgh really does run San Francisco. Uh, he was inducted under Stefano Manastiro when he was about 20, when Lima was about 20 years old. He said that the San Francisco family by the 1960s was, quote, at an all-time low. They were all afraid of their own shadows because... And then he says James Lanza, the boss, just doesn't offer any leadership. And he acts like a rabbit. He's afraid to meet with his own soldiers in case he's observed by you, by the federal agents. Lima speculated that the FBI would eventually drive the mafia nationwide completely underground, his words, and make it harder to investigate the body. He said, uh, you know, that's sort of in a way what's happened now. He, he said that uh, that wouldn't be a problem in San Francisco because there's nothing happening here anyway. So he's a bitter guy. But it could have a serious effect on other parts of the mafia across the country. According to Lima, Carlo Mocello, Carlos Mocello, uh, in New Orleans, was among the most powerful uh, mafia bosses in the country, if not in the world. He commanded great respect and loyalty from his men because he had a reputation for looking out for their financial well-being. He also said that Joe Bonanos had planned to settle, it was generic, West Coast, on the West Coast, after he'd been, quote, again, kicked out of the New York families. He said that Bonanno had better keep his head down or he would become a marked man. Actually, Bonanno's, uh, they had planned to, to move to Arizona for years, but so his information wasn't completely incorrect. Lima had also informed the FBI that the Kansas City crime family had a big financial interest in Vegas in the landmark hotel and casino, and that Anthony Savella, the nephew of boss Nick Savella, acted as the family's representative in Vegas and was keeping an eye on the construction progress out there. By 1976, the FBI described Lima as a former informant, meaning he had stopped talking to them. He died we in 1986. We have to mention Jimmy DeWiesel Fratiano, who had originally been out in San Francisco. Uh, he located there around 1968, and he did what he did everywhere. He stirred up trouble, discontent. Fratiano told the boss, Anthony Lima, he says that the new mayor, Joe Lito, who was really tight with Lima, wasn't doing enough to help the family. So Alito, he always denied being involved with mobsters, even though his grandfather had business ties with him. Uh, but Alito, when he was in private practice, represented Lima in his divorce from his first wife, he defended him years early in a connection with the Dijon murder in 1947. Lima uh, later told the FBI that Fratiano had gotten into a business loan from a bank connected with Alito and that Fratiano was anxious to get Alito to help him out setting up gambling operations and vending machine business and so forth. And uh, Alito just didn't want to deal with the guy. He, he, Fratiano was a guy you could tell was trouble. He looked like what he was, a gangster. So Fratiano tells anybody who will listen all across the United States that he has a low opinion uh, of the boss of Lanza. And he told Lima that Lanza should be replaced, Lima being the former boss, should be replaced because Lanza is just too cautious. Uh, he won't take advantage of the opportunities under Alito that were never real in the first place. Fran Tiano went on to become the acting boss of the L.A. mob in 1977. He becomes a witness and enters the government protection program. Anyway, for, let's go back for a moment and talk about Joe Barbosa out west. Barbosa was this thick-necked Portuguese-American boxer from New Bedford, Mass., and he grew uh, up in reform school, basically. Uh, in his brief life, Barbosa murdered at least 25 people, most of them, most of them, gangsters. By 1966, Barbosa carried a lot of weight in the Boston underworld. Uh, he had killed the Irish gang leader Eddie McLaughlin and Cornelius and Steve uh, Hughes on behalf of the Winter Hill Gang. In October 1966, Bardoz, Bardoza and three of his playmates, they were stopped there driving around Boston, a uh, place that had been called the Red Light District. It was, <laughs> it was a, the, the combat zone, it was called. It was a crazy place. Uh, a lot of sex shops and hookers and uh, for New England, which doesn't go for that sort of thing, it was, it was a big deal. 
Anyway, the officers, they search the car, they find weapons. Two of Barboza's guys are released on a light bail, but they hold Barboza for a hundred grand. That's around 800,000 today. He's unable to make the, the bail, of course, because he doesn't have a regular job. He gets paid for murders. He stays in jail. He's pissed off that Raymond Patriarca, whom he works for, who he had done most of these killings for, hasn't come forward to get him out of jail. And then a police detective told Barboza that someone in the Patriarca family had set him up for the arrest in the first place. He didn't believe it at first, but then when two of his crew raised $59,000 for the bail, they were both ambushed at the Nightlight Cafe. The killer stole the bail money and then murdered those guys and tossed their bodies in South, East, South Boston. Now Barboza understood the situation. And then he's sentenced to five years at Walpole Prison uh, on a weapons charge. Walpole is just, it's a small prison, but it's a, well, I don't know. It used to be a lunatic asylum. If you go into Walpole, you're better off just killing yourself. A year later, in 1967, Steve Fleming gets word to Barbosa that the Anganulo brothers, the mafia guys up in Boston, have assumed uh, that Barbosa's turned informant and they want to have him killed. Barboza gets hold of the FBI. He turns informant. Uh, his testimony put away Raymond Patriarca, Henry, uh, Henry Talamilio, a lot of other people. And on January 3rd, 1968, there's a bomb planted in the car of uh, Barboza's uh, attorney, John Fitzgerald, that blew his legs off. So Barboza's paroled in March of 1969, decides he's going to be Joe Bentley. He looked like a lot of things. He did not look like a Joe Bentley. And he relocates to Santa Rosa, California, which for, you know, a Boston guy is like China. They, they don't know. Um, so he he enters a culinary arts <laughs> art school, these people. But he didn't want to change his ways. In the summer of 1970, he murders a guy named Clay Wilson, um, who was a, also lived in Santa Rosa, a skinny crook who drove a bulldozer, uh, when he wasn't stealing things from people. So Wilson told Barboza about a 250,000, a job, 250,000 stocks, bonds, jewels that he had stolen from a home in Petaluma, California. So a few days later, Barboza, Wilson, Wilson's wife, and another woman walk into the woods near Santa Rosa. Barboza fires two shots into Wilson's head. He dug a hole for the body before he got there and covered it with a stump. It would still take three policemen to pull the stump up from the body. The two women who had listened to Barboza brag about owning the FBI and jailing innocent men, they kept their mouth shut because they figured he's got the FBI behind him. I mean, they know who he is, but they didn't realize he had been ratting out for years and he won his freedom that way. Barboza sneaks back in New England where... Maybe, possibly, he met with the mob bosses. He discusses the possibility of recanting his testimony and then all would be forgiven. The FBI never believed that. And they thought what he had actually gone to New England for, met with the bosses for, was plain and simple. He going to shake them down for a lot of money. He could do that because he was a killer. And the bosses, a lot of these were old guys at that point. They, they, you know, they had killers on the payroll, but... Killing Barboza would not be easy. I mean, he would strike first. So it's really possible he could have just been shaking him down. So what happened was when he's gone, he gets linked up to the Wilson killing when he's back in Massachusetts. And it's easy to find him. He's driving through North Bedford, a town just above. Uh, he leveled a pistol at a carload of people who had uh, cut him off. To, to, and so he pulls out a gun. Of course, what else would you do? And aims a gun at him. The guy calls the police. Uh, they stop Barboza. He's got a small arsenal in his bag, and he had a bag of marijuana with him, too, which, you know, kind of a big deal in those days. Uh, I wonder if young people realize that, that having a bag of marijuana at one point was, you know, a problem. So Barboza gets shipped off to Wampo again, and he's talking about going to recant all the testimony, every single word of it. But he's sitting in jail in this con named William Giraway. Uh, he tells William Garraway every detail about the Wilson murder. So Garraway thinks, great, thank you. And he trades that information with the Santa Rosa authorities because Massachusetts wasn't interested. And uh, the sheriffs go and they find Wilson's body beneath the stump. Again, three cops had to move the stump. But Bose is uh, extradited from Walpole back to California. He has to stand trial in state court. He pleads not guilty, of course, uh, to, to murdering Wilson. He's facing the death sentence, uh, 
but he, he he didn't seem to care by all accounts. One guy said, the prosecutor said, here he was with all kinds of evidence against him in a death penalty case, and he acted like he was in a small claims court. He wasn't concerned at all. I've been in that business for 34 years, prosecuting business for 34 years, and I've never seen anything look close to it. It was uncanny. Barboza got sentenced to five years to life, uh, but he had F. Lee Bailey, a really famous lawyer, uh, uh, protecting him, uh, representing him. Bailey managed to get him sent to Montana to a country club sort of prison to serve his time. After five years, the FBI appears at Barboza's hearing, uh, parole hearing to speak on his behalf, if you can believe this, because he's still threatening to recant his testimony. And he's released in October of 1975. He, now he's under the name Joe Donati. That's more like it. He hit, a, hit out in an apartment in San Francisco, and he stupidly befriended a, a small-time Boston who was out there named Jimmy Chalmers. And Chalmers, he sells the information. Uh, to where Barbosa is, to the New England mob. New England mob guy contacts Jimmy Lanza, who gives Angelou the okay to murder Barbosa in his territory. On February 11, 1976, Barbosa just turned 42 years old. Just before 4 p.m., he leaves his apartment with a, of a friend, Ted Charles, uh, to go have lunch. He had his keys in his hand. A white van pulls up close to him. Someone fires off four rounds into the right side of uh, the gangster, his right side of his face, literally blowing him apart. He never had a chance to reach. He had a Colt 35, 38 tucked in his jacket pocket. Uh, two years later, in 1978, there's a Sicilian hood named Sergio Marantia. Mar 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 He's a cocaine heroin guy. Uh, he moves to the U.S. from Florence, Italy, settles in San Francisco. He went to boss Jimmy Lanza uh, because he was a steady money maker, and Lanza likes that. So in 1982, Lanza, who was then living uh, in San Mateo, uh, put Mergahia into his family. But in 1991, he gets busted on a narcotics charge. He decides to cooperate with the government, and he sends away about a half a dozen hoods from California. They all go to prison. So by 1990, there's only a few made guys left in San Francisco mob. It was never that large to begin with. At its height, the FBI figures it had maybe 20 active members, and it was reduced to about 12 in the mid-1960s with an average age of 70. So Jimmy Lanza dies of natural causes in 2006 at age 103, and the San Francisco mob really just no longer exists at that point. Before I leave, I want to tell you about the Sika gang, the Sika brothers. They were led by uh, Joe Sika, uh, who liked to call himself JS. And he held uh, his court in the Formosa Cafe. Uh, it's still there. If you ever go to Los Angeles, it's a Chinese restaurant. It's been filmed and so forth. It's The food's good, by the way, but it's right outside some studio I've forgotten. And uh, it, it's like stepping back in time. If you get a chance to go, go. His brothers uh, worked with the Chicago mob, kind of uh, with the racing wire situation uh, when that was new out there. Uh, and then he'd been arrested with Mickey Cohen uh, later for busting up James Reagan's office in Los Angeles. So he was tied in with those guys. Um, Joe Sika had a higher, when he was arrested with Mickey Cohen, he got a higher bail. Um, <laughs> So Sika worked anyway with Jack Dragna, uh, Los Angeles, uh, because he was on Dragna's turf. Uh, the Sikas were never made Worked guys. Closely made with uh, uh, kind of sort of two like, really well-set hoods, uh, Blinky Plumero and Frankie Carbo. The brothers had an enormous gambling and drug empire. Drug was, was where their, really their money was. It stretched from San Diego to San Jose. Uh, they were huge importers of heroin, uh, and they had a guy named Pat the Priest who would silence any witnesses against them. They were vicious. They put up money for Deep Throat, the film. I don't know if you're aware of that. They also had a lot of bookies they controlled uh, in the black areas of Los Angeles, and um, they did deals with Chicago's guy, uh, Chris Petty, for years. He distanced himself, the brothers distanced themselves from Mickey Cohen when he fell out of favor with the L.A. families. But they were definitely a power out west, and we should mention them. 